Hello, good afternoon from Essen and welcome to our Changemakers Chat. A couple of days ago, we launched our new international brand campaign, Time for Action. And it's time for action indeed, as we are transforming E.ON into a fully sustainable company. And that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, but of course, as we made a big promise with our campaign, we have to deliver against that promise. This raises a couple of questions. First, how do we uh, balance the need of customers to be more sustainable with the requirement to also have affordable energy? How do we translate our story into a story that is also recognized by the capital markets, by our investors? And of course, how do we use internal change for transformation of our company? I'm very much delighted to be joined today in our conversation by our CEO, Leo Birnbaum, and live from Berlin, our special guest, Paul Polman. As a CEO of Unilever, Paul was the driving force behind the transformation of Unilever into a sustainable and successful company. So it's not exclusive, both, quite the contrary. And with his own business now, imagine, Paul is consulting leaders and executives across the globe in their transformational journey, in their journey to transform their businesses in a, into a more sustainable world. A bit of housekeeping. If you would like to enjoy the full quality of the conversation, please enlarge your screen to full screen mode. If you have questions, which we would love to answer in the end of the session, please go back to small screen mode and type in your questions. For our conversation today, I'm accompanied by Stefan Hohmeister, who worked with uh, Paul in the past and who, as a, as a seasoned uh, business leader and consultant, is now helping companies to um, manage their individual transformations. Hi, Stefan. It's good to see you. Good to have you. Transformation, Hi, change and E.ON. What's your take on this? Thank you, Axel. I'm an E.ON customer. I'm an E.ON supplier and I've been involved in several major company transformations. From my perspective, E.ON is very well positioned to become and to also be perceived as the leader, not only the maker, of the sustainable energy turnaround. And based on my experience, also including, for example, making T-Mobile more customer-centric, I think E.ON will need four things for this change to be successful. First, you need purpose. It needs to be very clear in every moment why the change you, you want to bring is right for the world, right for your company, right for your customers, and right for every single employee. Two, you will need role models. You will need to walk the talk. You will need to see people in the company who do what you say you want to do. Three, you will need development opportunities because change is many things. I think change is great, change is inspiring, but change is also exhausting. It's hard work. So therefore, everyone in this company needs the opportunity to develop, to train, and to routinize new behaviors in a safe environment, on and off the job. And finally, you will need consistency. Consistency from systems and processes that prevent the wrong behavior and that reward the right behavior. And once these four pillars of change are in place, up, and running. I'm confident that you as E.ON will be and be perceived strongly by all your stakeholders, including the capital markets, and you'll be perceived as the leader of the sustainable energy turnaround. Thanks a lot, Stefan. And uh, back to the studio here in uh, Essen. Welcome, Leo. Good to have you. Welcome, Paul, in Berlin. Good to have you uh, as well. Let's start with our first topic for the day, um, capital markets. Leo, hand of hearts, be honest. Um, capital markets and sustainability, is this um, a real thing or is this just some lip service by fancy bankers from Frankfurt in blue suits and purple ties? Hmm. First, uh, I would love to hear Paul's perspective afterwards, but from my perspective, I would be a bit provocative. Uh, they will not reward sustainability, they will just expect it. Maybe not now, but in the not too distant future, there will be just the expectation sustainability is there. 
I can give you examples. Um, we have the EU taxonomy. So we have to show that the investments which we are making and the business which we are conducting are compliant to good practices, do no harm principles, do no significant harm principles. Actually, when it was introduced, the EU was thinking this is just something for the banks. But then the banks say, okay, we engage only in such businesses, then they expect it from their customers. Yeah. And so, you know, every utility will actually strive to be as taxonomy compliant as somehow possible. Will it be a differentiator to be 80 or 90% taxonomy compliant? No, it will be not. It will be a necessity. And therefore, I would just say, you know, like if we think if, if we just fast roll forward in a few years, if you're not sustainable, you will soon become somebody into whom the people will just not invest. So I think it's going to be a necessity. But yes, there's also reward. You know, we see green financing slightly better. In the future, it will be significantly better than the alternative of not sustainable financing. Uh, we actually see that there are high multiples being paid, uh, but that's just because of the growth expectations behind it. So capital markets believe sustainability is, a, is something that's going to stay. And because it's going to stay, it means significant growth. Therefore, being engaged in sustainability means good perspective. And that is rewarded and increasingly just expected. So, but then, uh, yeah, you, I agree with uh, Leo and, uh, and there's good Paul, afternoon. Yeah. And Hi, see Paul. You. I, I did not know you were in Essen. I should have known. You know, I grew up in Enschede, which is close to Münster. <laughs> so we've been neighbors our whole lives. It's uh, not far from uh, from where you are. But um, uh, happy to be here. I'm actually in Berlin now talking to the new uh, government to be about their energy policies. Uh, the intentions have always been there in Germany, but the progress in some times has been relatively slow. And I think the change of government that you've seen not to be political, but uh, might be an opportunity to accelerate things. I remember that uh, Leo was explaining to me your incredible vision of becoming a greener, a more digital, a more distributed energy company and actually playing a key role in that energy transition. And that was obviously of, of lots of interest to me. Um, but that it would also take in a German environment, I remember Leo saying six to seven years to get windmills or to get solar panels approved and a bureaucratic process that is too slow. One of the things that we are discussing right now with an organization I belong to, the European Climate Foundation and the German uh, government to be, is really to how can we implement some of these things uh, faster. And that can only be to the benefit of E.ON, in my opinion. Coming to the capital markets, I do agree with Leo in, in his assessment once more. You know, when we started, regretfully, COVID, there was this broad belief in the newspapers and uh, with the cynics and the skeptics that all companies would go back to cost cutting and short termism to just basically survive and that ESG would be dead. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth. You project yourselves now admittedly with the benefit of hindsight one and a half years further. And we see actually that the financial markets probably have been seeing one of the biggest changes. ESG investing is estimated to be $50 trillion by 2025 at the current uh, level. We have uh, $90 trillion of money under management as we go into Glasgow next week that are making strong commitments to be net zero. We see the task force of financial disclosure that was implemented in seven countries, now in 47 countries. By all measures, enormous progress. I don't think the financial markets, if I may be honest, have moved for moral reasons. I think they've really moved because they've rapidly realized that this is not only about risk mitigation, but increasingly about the enormous opportunities that this offers. And this is why you see uh, the, the capital funds, if you want to start to float in that direction. You know, COVID has reminded us of many things. First and foremost, that we don't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. But it has also shown us the enormous costs of our failures. The governments in the world have spent over $17 trillion saving lives and livelihoods. Um, the GDP is estimated to have lost this decade about $27 trillion. And people have started to realize that this cost of inaction, in this case with dealing with the COVID fallout of it, 
the cost of inaction is significantly higher than the cost of action. And that makes it such an attractive proposition. My final comment is on the financial markets and on the need to move to ESG. We've clearly seen in the in the uh, companies uh, that are responsibly run, and you are definitely one example of that with clear commitments you've made for a 75% reduction by 2030 to be net zero by 2040 in scope one and two, to be net zero by 2050 if you include scope three. For companies like yours, these are major announcements that still need to happen. But what we have seen now is interesting, that companies, even within their own industry sector, that more aggressively are attacking these negative externalities, if you want to, are also companies that are now better valued increasingly by the financial market. So issues that historically have been seen as non-material are rapidly becoming material. And not surprisingly, uh, we just finished the uh, proxy season, the shareholder meetings in the US where most data is available, and about 75% of the issues that were brought forward by the shareholders, by 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 the financial market, if you want to call it that, had to do with uh, ESG more than at any time in history. So the train has left the station. I think companies that understand that and position themselves well for the future, like E.ON, are going to be doing very well. And companies that continue to deny this trend, I think we'll meet them soon at the graveyard of dinosaurs. <laughs> Can, can I just build on that, um, Paul? First, um, I agree. In the end, uh, capital markets are cynical. They are looking for growth and for lower risk. Uh, and if sustainability is perceived as something that's going to stay, which is clearly the perception, then it means being sustainable means better growth options and less risk. And that is rewarded. Yeah. So, but now I just want to make, I, I want to give it a different twist because that feels like we should be now as a company be sustainable because of, you know, a financial motive. I actually also think people just want to do the right thing. It's actually motivating if you are engaged in a business which just delivers a product, a service which society needs and which is helpful to society also in the long run. And so I believe, so our, our employees take satisfaction from doing something that is valuable to society and which is sustainable. And therefore, as a, being engaged in a sustainable business is also deeply satisfying. You can tell your neighbor in the evening what you have done during the day without hiding something. And you can be proud about what you're doing and you don't need to justify yourself. Your kids at school can be proud about the job that the parents are doing at E.ON. So I think there is a motive beyond the purely financial ones. We have started with financial markets, but I would say, why should we be sustainable? We should be sustainable because eventually it's the right thing to do. And that actually, right that actually leads us to the, to the second part of our conversation, doing the right thing. Uh, let's go to the second part. Paul, you recently published a new book called Net Positive. If you would sum it up uh, into one key takeaway, and then now I know it's a bit cruel to do that. If you would sum it up to one key takeaway, what would that be? I'm actually going into my little purse, which I have next to me. <laughs> so I can <laughs> Excellent. the book. Then you see it's real. It exists. You know, you the situation really, is wanted, very simple. You, you wanted and, to send uh, why me I wrote this book is obviously to help people huh. and uh, accelerate the conversion of the private sector. Most CEOs, if not all CEOs, know what needs to be done. Um, they know that they don't want more climate change, more people going to bed hungry, uh, more air pollution. But collectively, we're not able to deliver. In fact, we're falling terribly short on the sustainable development goals. Climate change is projected for this decade the carbon emissions to go up by 16% when we need a 45% reduction. If no actions are taken, we're well above 3% warming, which would be absolutely catastrophic. Even with the submissions now going into Glasgow, there's a huge gap of at least one, one and a half degrees in global warming. And frankly, we cannot afford that. So the whole issue is for companies as well, is how do you do the transition? The why is well understood. And the book talks about how companies can profit 
not from creating the world's problems, but from solving the world's problems. With a simple question, like, is the world better off because you as a company are in it or not? A world overshoot day this year was July 29th, which is actually the day that we use up more resources than the world can replenish. In other words, every day after that, I would argue we're actually stealing from future generations. So many companies are saying we need to do CSR, corporate social responsibility. But corporate social responsibility is about being less bad. I used to murder 10 people, now I only murder five people. Am I a better murderer? Less bad is simply not acceptable anymore in a world that already overshoots its planetary boundaries. Then people say, okay, I get it. We need to be sustainable. But sustainable is neither good nor bad. A very admirable position to be in. But when the world needs to repair itself, restore itself, when we have overshot these planetary boundaries, the only thing and the only thinking that we believe is long-term successful is a thinking that is restorative, reparative, regenerative, which we call net positive. And the net positive companies have a few characteristics that position them well in the future. The first one is they take responsibility of their total handprint in society. They don't just like many companies outsource their value chain and also outsource their responsibility. That simply doesn't work anymore. You see the issues that Facebook has right now, celebrating the positive sides of their platform, but not willing to deal with the negatives doesn't work anymore. Net positive companies, take total responsibility. They operate for the long-term benefit of all of their stakeholders, which includes the planet and future generations. They see shareholder results as a, a result of what they do, not as a myoptic objective. They operate on the longer term time frame for that reasons. And equally and more importantly, like you do with your organization under leaders, uh, Leo's leadership, is they are actually involved in the broader transformations that society is needing. So that's a tall order. But what we have increasingly seen is that more and more companies aspire to be there, moving to regenerative agriculture, putting training programs in place to get people ready for a more and, and different agile environment, if you want to, putting different social uh, safety nets around their people, guaranteeing what we would call livable wages versus in many countries, um, uh, minimum wages, which are not enough. So they attack proactively all the aspects of environmental, social, and governance, if you want to. And these are the net positive companies. And what we're trying to do in this book is explain that it as, is as much about a leadership transformation or a human transformation that leads to a company transformation and ultimately a societal transformation. And the book, in a very practical way, takes you through uh, steps to make that conversion. And then finally, and last but not least, it also points out the need to be consistent. What we see uh, currently happening in many companies is they make the big commitments, but have a hard time to implement them. It's easy to make 20, 50 commitments when you don't have to deal with it. It's easy to make bold statements when nobody is following up. But how do we create that trust which ultimately is that currency that we need. How do we get that consistency in words and actions? And the book in a chapter which we call Elephants in the Room doesn't shy away from trade associations who advocate different things than what companies are saying. Money in politics, um, the uh, human rights in the value chain, CEO salaries, the need to pay tax to uh, participate in this uh, economic environment. So all of the tougher choices that CEOs struggle with. And we hope that ultimately it creates a movement, a movement where people say, I want to go to a net positive university. I want to work to, for a net positive company. I want my company itself to be net positive. And this is uh, what we've started with the launch of this book only uh, two and a half weeks ago now. Um. Paul, I'll definitely read it. You wanted to send me the script beforehand, but I might not have been able to read it anyway because of the upcoming Capital Market Day, but I will definitely read it. I love the idea of net positive, which is much more extreme than, I mean, it's just going one step further into thinking. Um, if I may, uh, also for the colleagues uh, listening in, um, 
we have defined goals, uh, sustainability goals, uh, not only for CO2, also for HS and E, for diversity, for other areas as well. We are breaking them down uh, on a yearly basis uh, uh, and we are going to break them down also on a unit level because it's actually worthless if it's just on a group level. Uh, we are also uh, going to incorporate those, uh, three of those ESG targets into the long-term remuneration of our executives. Uh, it's already in the long-term remuneration system of the board. It will be included in the remuneration system of all executives uh, starting next year. So we try to have this consistency, so all have the same goals, all have a part of the goal and have a responsibility. So we're trying to do all these things. We have a strategy which is clearly tilted towards sustainability. So the, the, the themes for the strategy are digitization, di uh, sustainability and growth in whatever sequence, depends on the audience, which one you pick first. Yeah? Uh, and, but, so I think we're on a good track, but we are, and now Paul, that's one question to you. We are actually far uh, from net positive. Right now, these days, we struggle actually to keep the fit for 55 focus in the EU because with the turmoil in commodity markets, there is now there are numerous, you know, governments which are trying to intervene. We shouldn't be as extreme. We should actually be take some steps back. Our customers can't pay for this transformation, and and we are trying to balance this somehow. And so, actually, uh, right now, net positive is not my biggest concern. My my biggest concern is keeping the momentum towards even sustainable, that would be already something. So, yeah. um, and maybe that's one question to you. So like from your experience at Unilever, did you hit a difficult you know, trade-off that seemed extremely difficult to many stakeholders and how did you resolve that? Maybe just telling us a story, an example, helps us also for our uh, situation in which we are in right now. Yeah, I think what you are saying is very important and the book addresses that. I think we're at a situation now in in the history of mankind, if we like this or not, Leo, where the private sector is actually running ahead of the governments. And that's not surprising because they have to deal with the immediate effects of these shortcomings, be it the destruction of biodiversity, be it climate change, be it inequality. And what we see with COP as well, the uh, that is happening next week, the COP26 in Glasgow, that the voices of the private sector, even from the high abatement, high emitting industries, is actually much louder. And the movement that we're seeing is much faster than we can get out of governments right now. I believe that because we haven't addressed these issues, a big part of the population feels disencharged, feels excluded. And we've elected people based on populist or xenophobic or, or nationalist platforms that are not very helpful. And it is important that we rally together and make these voices heard. Uh, since many of your businesses uh, are a big part of your business is still in Germany as you globalize the business, it is clear that I think there will be some momentum where the Germans might be leading also in Europe to be sure that this agenda can be put in practice, but also where there is an economic, uh, macroeconomic framework that's put in place, as you rightfully say, to achieve these things. And um, equally importantly, doing that in a way that supports industries that need to transform itself, but also support um, people that often suffer. Many of the people that are dissatisfied can really not afford a price on carbon or a higher cost for electricity. Mm -hmm. So this just transition, this social part of that equation is very important. With Unilever, and like you do yourself, any CEO has always needs to make trade-offs. Uh, that is not something new. And I'm always a little bit surprised that when we talk about the future of humanity, that we have such a hard time making these trade-offs. The uh, most of the value creation in any company happens four or five years out or more. If I decide to go into China, if I build a factory, if I um, open a uh, launch a new product, uh, all these things have longer-term payouts, just like training and development does or putting in new IT systems. So when it comes to the issue of um, sustainability, then obviously there are trade-offs. When we made our own energy use totally green, we had to invest in wind, we had to invest in solar. In fact, it wasn't that much. Many were willing to take the capital risks. We didn't even have to take them in most cases. But when we, for example, had to convert these markets to sustainable palm oil, we had to create that transition. We had to create a market for 
sustainable palm oil certificates. We had to invest in that to get the industry moving. And like you, I support these two principles that you said very well. The first one is that um, you know we need to do what is right to position our companies for the longer term. And this is absolutely the right positioning. And secondly, there is something with size that also brings responsibility. Viktor Frankl in his book, Man Search for Meaning, said that when they built the Statue of Liberty on the east coast of the United States, they forgot to build the Statue of Responsibility on the west coast. These things go hand in hand. Have I ever had a trade-off that was big enough to worry about, um, to worry that the financial community goes after me? No, because we made a 10-year plan. We don't have to boil the ocean in, in one go or eat the elephant in one bite. Mm. And then we do a lot of explaining. You need to explain also to the financial market why this is a better value creating model for the longer term than any other model. And that is obviously where many CEOs still need some help because it isn't all that clear yet to them and they need to educate themselves in that. Which brings me to my final point, that in order to manage the financial market and get them to be supportive, which I broadly believe they want to, it is also important to find the right shareholders. In Unilever, when I came in during my 10-year tenure, right at the beginning, I stopped quarterly reporting. I moved our compensation system to the long term. I stopped giving guidance. And the reason was really is I wanted to get out of this myopic focus on the short term. But I also wanted to say to the shareholders, we don't want these short term speculators. They are not called shareholders. They are called share speculators. So I wanted to get real shareholders. And we spent a disproportionate amount of time over those 10 years attracting the right shareholders. And what we found was, uh, Leo, as we shifted our shareholder base, we also got more appreciation for what we were doing as a company, ultimately a 300% shareholder return. But we were also better able to communicate to them uh, our strategy and why actually that was a better value creating strategy than any other that we could think of at that time. I, I have to react to this one. I, I mean, I, I love it. I mean, stopping quarterly reporting uh, and, uh, and uh, searching for the right shareholders. I have to say we have not been so daring. Um, so my perspective was somehow you have to cope with the shareholder base which you have. But actually, E.ON has changed its shareholder base completely over the last five years. Because if you look five years back, we were uh, a risk which could not be you know, calculated for investors. We had coal in there, we had the German energy politics, we had the unsolved nuclear issue there. We sorted all of that out you know, by the nuclear agreement which we did, uh, by the spin-off of Uniper, by the focus on renewables, uh, networks and customers. And as a result, now we have probably you know, like the 20 largest uh, investment funds worldwide as long only investors in our base. And basically we are held by RWE 15% plus long-term investors, long only. You know? So it's actually a complete change in the shareholder base. But in our case, it was a result of what we did. We didn't look actively for it, but I see this the provocation from Paul that you can get, you get challenged. Yeah. So. <laughs> and, but you know, Leo, the reality is most um, of our colleagues that have done these very demanding jobs that you are now doing, and I don't envy you for that, but um, you know, they have a tenure or horizon of, the tenure of a Fortune 500 CEO is now less than four and a half years. So they cater to the, or dance to the pipes of the current shareholders. But, you know, I had an advantage that I had been CFO of Nestle for three years before. So I had a little bit of an understanding of the financial market. But you know, who are your shareholders? A company like Unilever has a few million shareholders and they all have different opinions about what they want and how mm -hmm. the company should be run. And if in the end of the day, you try to compromise all of them or or listen to all of them for that matter, you would become schizophrenic and your company most likely will be driven into the ground. But if you actively seek the shareholders that align, we actually doubled the holding period as well as the amount of money that was held. The top 10 doubled the holdings and the rotation of the top 100 was half of what we had seen before. Admittedly, we only saw these results coming in in year six, seven, eight, nine, but ultimately, that was also um, one of the reasons 
why when Kraft Heinz tried to, an aborted attempt with financial manipulation to buy uh, Unilever, that they did not succeed because we had the right shareholder base that had bought into our value creation model. And frankly, they've been right. Uh, since that takeover bit, their share price collapsed further, our share price increased more. So they've made the right decision. But it was because we had the right shareholders that we probably also got more courage to do some of the other things that might be a little bit more difficult in an enormous transition like this. I'm listening carefully to you. It means I need to survive the first four and a half years so that I can see the benefits <laughs> sure. in year six to eight. <laughs> but, we need but, you. But I think the only one that will be mad at this will be your wife. We <laughs> Op optimism, <laughs> naive optimism is a prerequisite for a board member. Because if you're not an optimist, then you're lost anyway. Let's, let's yeah. call it a can-do attitude. <laughs> Before we deep dive into the Q&A, I'd like to throw one additional stakeholder group into the equation, which is the base of colleagues. Um, so as a brand person, I strongly believe that brand building starts from within. Uh, and the question is now also change. How does it come from within in our third section? Yeah, transformation and systems change. Paul, knowing you for more than 20 years, in my personal view, I regard you as one of the most impactful change makers and change leaders on the planet. And in fact, you have created, uh, co-founded Imagine, targeting two of the most, the biggest issues mankind is facing, i.e. climate change and global inequality. Now, beyond the lessons you already shared, like stopping to focus on the short term, starting to focus on the long term, starting to influence your shareholder base. Is there any other key lesson you could share with us regarding how to drive transformation at scale that lasts and how important is purpose? Yeah, purpose is obviously incredibly important. I don't think you can drive scale, uh, Stefan, if you don't have purpose. Colin Meyer describes purpose very well in his book, Prosperity where he says uh, to positively, uh, to profitably address the issues of people and planet. There needs to be a profit component to it, otherwise you cannot continue to do it. We cannot live off charity, especially not uh, with the uh, impact and skill that the private sector needs to have in this transformation. But the, the most important thing in a very volatile environment that we now currently live in, where many of the things are unpredictable, is that people at all levels in the organization know what they need to do. That there is a glue that, that creates a strong culture where people work together, where a trust level is very high, uh, where people feel energized and engaged. And that can only come from a strong purpose, which is really your ultimate reason for being. I think you're in an ideal position with the way that you have uh, pivoted your organization, which wasn't easy to do, but to be a catalyzer for the energy transition. And you've positioned you in a new area that might not be fully understood yet because it is such a new area, but that is really this multiplier effect that you're creating and is absolutely crucial to attack climate change. It's one of the reasons I'm here. So purpose is important. Now, why is that so important? because you have to make some tough decisions. We've talked about trade-offs, for example. I see many companies saying the right thing for the long term, but as soon as pressure comes in, they pivot towards the shareholder or do the short term. We've seen in the US when people were laid off and companies were suffering that CEOs took salary increases. That's not very purposeful. We've seen situations where companies, and, and I can call them out, companies like Boeing have spend significantly more on share buybacks and special dividends than they invested in R&D in the companies until one of their airplanes comes down and the whole thing starts to unravel. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the mindless pursuit of short-term returns and shareholder um, uh, primacy, if you want to, is not a very motiv motivating thing for all of the stakeholders that you need to be long-term successful. Purpose does. When Unilever moved to the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which really was about decoupling growth from environmental impact, increasing overall social impact, we saw our engagement scores from the middle 
of a, a benchmark of 8,000 companies go to the top of the top tercile. We saw 2 million people applying each year in the company, as, uh, as much after Apple and Google, the third most on uh, LinkedIn, things that we could not understand. But this younger generation is certainly driven by uh, self-selecting companies where they can find that purpose, where they can do a, make a difference that is bigger than each of us individually can. So in this change process, especially where you have a lot of critics and skeptics, where changes are not easy, where you have to go against the odds, do things that haven't been done before, form these broader coalitions, expose yourself, take risks, set targets that you know are needed, even if you don't know how to get there. Most CEOs will set targets not to lose. We're talking about targets on how to win. Uh, you know, these are all things that are risky, that are new, that are uncomfortable, and for that purpose serves enormously. Um, I always say it's it's what you do in the dark that makes you shine in the light, and that is certainly the case uh, here as well. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And one question to you, Leo. Building on a common thought, a red thread through what I've heard Paul say and what I've heard you say, Leo, which is about doing the right thing, which to me is at the heart of one of the ingredients I think Aeon will need for your future success, and that's leadership. So my question to you is, Leo, what kind of courageous leadership do you think Eon needs to adopt and how will you lead that change? Uh, first, I think we have a, a privileged position um, because our business as we have established it so far is by, by itself sustainable. So we don't need to abolish what we are doing and doing something completely different because uh, the energy transition will not happen without our networks, the energy transition will not happen without our customer solutions. Green energy needs to go to our customers. We connect our customers to good energy. So by definition, we have no purpose issue. And uh, as I said already earlier in this talk, it's the basis of modern societies which we are actually providing. And therefore, the, the, the starting position is great. The, the, the business by itself is already kind of like purposeful and, uh, and so we don't have to make that many compromises. That, uh, but, but, now comes the but. Um, I, I think we need to fight for efficiency nevertheless because we can invest only and we need to invest massively. We can invest only if we can free up the funds. And so actually it, it, for us creating profits is something that's great for the shareholders, but it is even better for the companies because it allows us to, uh, to continue to invest. So efficiency, you know, you need to earn the right to grow. Uh, if, you, if you don't deliver, you have no right to grow and capital markets will not give you the money. So uh, I, just, I would just like to say, first, we have a great starting position, but we have to be uh, seen as somebody who really delivers. The difficult leadership is, um, is we will have to overcome our doubts. Yeah? And uh, let me just explain. So I looked at the Stromerzeugungsradar, the power generation radar, which you can actually look up in the internet and which shows you on a daily basis where is our power coming from. And I was just looking at this generation radar to understand what has happening over the last weeks. And I was looking at the September uh, picture. In September, we had no wind. And we had lots of sun, but only during the day. And actually, we delivered our purpose, energy supply, and energy, we delivered that on the basis of lignite, hard coal, and nuclear uh, to our customers. And I have no clue how we can do that if we now switch off um, uh, coal and we switch off nuclear, which we will. Now, we are talking about building 30 gigs or 40 gigs of uh, uh, gas-fired capacity, but I don't see that economies. So I'm struggling completely how we will make ends meet. Yeah? And not because I don't want it to happen, but because we have a huge responsibility and us not delivering is just not an option. So the courageous leadership is that you know like you have to make the impossible somehow happen and now we are not the generators ourselves we are just enabling the generators yeah so what is the contribution we can make what is what are the risks which we can take when do we need to yell out stop this doesn't work and so um, 
So the courageous leadership is to move ahead despite the doubts that we have. And that's a very difficult one uh, because, you know, the, it's just so unacceptable if we fail. And so, you know, this is a very personal insight. I just, I, I was just looking at calendar week 36. Look it up yourself. Calendar week 36 of this year. And then you wonder, oh, how are we going to do that in 10 years? I know how we can do it today. How are we going to do it in 10 years? And then I need to talk to politicians. What needs to happen so that we can do it in 10 years? And I, you know, like, and we need to push for it. And I think that's the courageous leadership that we expose ourselves. And sometimes we say the inconvenient stuff, even though it's so much easier to always say the political correct stuff. But um, yeah, uh, it will be exciting for the next 10 years. Uh, so the courageous leadership is to always deliver no matter what. Yeah, I agree. Maybe one build and one question to you, Paul. I think the, the build is, I think your statements are spot on regarding courage. I think we all are fearful at times. And I think that's good. I think being fearful is good in many ways. But I think having the courage is to do what's right, despite the fear. And I'm thinking, Paul, to what extent is it in fact even harder for Leo, given the setup of his business, is it the same? Is it similar? Or is it even harder for him to marry profit and sustainability like you've done at Unilever? What do you think? Well, I don't want to compare because these jobs are incredible jobs with enormous pressures from all the different stakeholders and then uh, things that uh, you have to deal with in a broader environment that you often cannot uh, influence alone and need to be done in these broader coalitions. So all these jobs are tough when it gets to, uh, especially when it gets to the size of company that uh, Leo is leading. But you're obviously, you've obviously thought about that before and positioned yourself well for that future, which makes it so exciting. When I came to Unilever, only 10% of our products were sourced sustainably, despite having won all the prizes and started any initiative in the world, like the marine stewardship of fishery or the round table of sustainable palm oil, 10%. So moving to 100% sustainable sourcing was a tall order. Um, and I'm sure now with uh, Leo that his bit biggest bottleneck or challenge is actually not the strategy in, in its company or his ambitions, but the environment and the frameworks that he has to deal with that actually sometimes work in an opposite direction. So how do you deal with that in a politically charged, sometimes um, highly competitive landscape that is not uh, always easy? But it was Nelson Mandela who said it always looks impossible until it is done. And, and uh, this is actually then again where the courage comes in. What we clearly have seen during COVID, a clear bifurcation in companies with different types of leadership. And it happens to be that uh, courage comes from the French word cur, which is heart. So leaders with a high level of empathy, compassion, um, humility, humanity, uh, purpose-driven, um, understand the power of partnership, think multi-generational, that these leaders have done significantly better during that crisis. And the main reason for that probably is more in tune with society, which helps if you run a business, but also more engaged with the, um, with the employees and your whole workforce in terms of trust and confidence. And that's such an important part of any change process uh, that, that is going on in all companies right now. So courageous leaders are uh, important, uh, especially now, as I mentioned before, when you need to take responsibility of your total handprint in society, when you need to set absolutely audacious targets that make you feel uncomfortable, when you cannot do all these things alone, when you have to work on the broader systems changes, that is difficult and many CEOs, frankly, have not been trained for that. So that's why we put as a subtitle how courageous companies thrive by giving more than they take. And I think you're very blessed in E.ON for two reasons. The, the way you've thought about your strategy, which undoubtedly will evolve further as you move forward, uh, but also with the leadership that you have. So the ingredients are there to continue to be successful. And I think that will manifest itself in many different ways. I'd like to, although I would love to continue the conversation, to put a little stop here because to open up the stage 
for our colleagues, actually the ones who will make it happen. Um, and as a strong community, we are here to do it as a team in the spirit of we has no limits. So let's come um, to uh, the questions of our colleagues from across all businesses. So the first question comes from Philip here from Germany. Paul, question to you. If you had one message to the leaders of E.ON, what would it be? You know, it's um, interesting when I was writing it down, when you say we has no limits. In my uh, life, I do a lot with my wife for blind people. We have a blind foundation in Africa and have 26,000 uh, blind children in school, blind or deaf blind to unlock literacy for life and to give them the same opportunities. And they're often the most marginalized people in society. And as a result, I got involved with um, Perkins, the School of the Blind in um, Boston, Massachusetts. And they have as a slogan, and these people are blind or deaf blind, they have a slogan is all we see is possibilities. And one of my blind friends says always, uh, and, and I climb mountains with him, he's the first blind climber who did Mount Everest, attitude is altitude. And I think that is the most important message for all of us. Helen Keller, just to stay with this theme, Helen Keller was blind and deaf and spoke six languages. And always people would pity her and say, this must be terrible to be blind and deaf. And she said, no, it is not. It is actually worse to have eyes and to not be able to see. And we live in a world, unfortunately, where we have too many people that are fortunate enough to have eyes, but are not able to see. So the most important message in this book, actually, is that personal leadership transformation, that you need to work on yourself. We call it conveniently finding your purpose or do you care? But I hope with this talk that you understand it runs a little bit deeper. And that's only something you can do yourselves. We've never been so forewarned about what is going to happen in this world. We've never been so forearmed with tools to do something about it. Yet collectively, we seem paralyzed. This is, above anything else, a leadership challenge. If I quickly push in a second message, which came out very clearly also with what Leo was saying, this is an enormous opportunity. We are not talking here about scarcity. We're talking here about positioning your companies in the future, which is the growth story of the century. Any investment we now make in a greener economy creates more jobs, better jobs, a higher return on those investments and a more resilient economy. The alternative simply isn't there. The alternative would be to give up on humanity, which I'm certainly not a lot willing to do. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we've lost 68% of the species over the last five decades, mammals, birds, reptiles. We don't want to have that happen to us. And that's why we need to act. So it's that combination of optimism of the opportunities that we have and a certain level of being outraged that we've not been able to take these challenges seriously, collectively, and start working them. And if you have that combination of optimism and outrage, I think you're very well positioned to be a leader uh, tackling these uh, challenges that we're talking about. Thank you, Paul. The next question from Katja uh, here from the German business goes into the direction of uh, an important dimension of, of leadership, authenticity. What are your private actions to foster sustainability? How does your job influence your private behavior? Maybe, Leo? I think the, the issue is here, clearly, first, you need to walk the talk. So I bought an e-car. Yeah? It's, it's the simple things. Yeah? Um, actually, um, I have been asked this question before. I don't feel my answers are satisfying because I can give you now many answers. You know, like I, I buy only sustainable, as a sustainable meat. How do you say that? A meat which is actually, you know, um, I was saying which was harvested under decent conditions and so on and so forth. But if I if I make a list of all I'm doing. I always realize I'm a very privileged person that I can do all of that. And so I feel, am I doing enough? So the reality is I'm trying to do my things. I don't exaggerate. Uh, I don't do that many travels. Uh, I have a somehow 
sufficiently modest life, but I don't feel I'm a good role model when it comes to sustainability, because if everybody on the planet would be living like I do, it wouldn't be enough. So I've heard this question before and I feel unsatisfied with the answer I can give every single time. I'm doing many things the right way, but in the end it's not adding up sufficiently and that's one of the struggles that I have. I think we all struggle with that. And not, not to show Paul, what would he be your take on this one? No, we cannot be satisfied. 80% uh, of the carbon emissions is done by 10% of the population and we belong to these 10%. And it's not only our travel, it's the houses, it's the way we live. I've made all my houses carbon neutral. I don't have a car, I stopped eating meat. Uh, for, for most of the time, it's nearly an exception if I don't. But still then, I still know that I can do 10 times more to do that. I've decided that um, now with my mission with uh, Imagine, with the broader efforts like advising the government, now the UK government on the COP26, uh, being the chair of the UN Global Compact, uh, working on the future of management education by chairing the side business school at Oxford and many of our other activities that I can best use my uh, skill sets and my talents to move the private sector faster uh, into their decarbonization and to work with the governments that aren't moving so fast to give them a little bit more courage to do that. Ultimately, the bigger challenge that we have now is uh, on decarbonization are challenges that we need to attack uh, collectively. Someone very wisely once said is, you cannot solve these big challenges at the level that these issues are created. So this is the intersection that I work on. But till the day I move to another world, hopefully even a better world, um, we will have to fight to do our part. And that only doesn't mean ourselves reducing in certain ways. It might also be converting to more sustainable habits. Often doesn't mean that we have to give up much. But within that transition, that we should also fight for the ones that are left behind. Any any system once more where too many people feel that they're not participating or increasingly suffer, like we've seen with COVID, like we've seen with climate change, it is that just transition, that social equity that we should build into all of the things we're doing. That is uh, the other side of climate uh, is climate justice. And that actually is ultimately the more important thing. What we're talking here about is, is uh, uh, humanity and basic human values climate change and tackling climate change is actually just a means to an end in that respect. Question from Stefan. Um, looking a bit outside of E.ON, could you name one or two companies that surprised you positively over the last year linking to sustainable change and maybe one or two companies that uh, are your disappointment in your eyes? I leave the disappointment parts to Paul. <laughs> 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 uh, so let's talk about the positive surprises. Yeah, let's talk yeah. about the positive yeah. ones. Um, I, I think I'm actually quite impressed, for example, by what uh, Deutsche, uh, uh, what Frank Appel is doing uh, at Deutsche Post. He has said, you know, like I'm one of the big, biggest logistics groups in the world and I need to make it carbon neutral. And so he went out and made the commitment to capital markets, we're going to spend, I think, the number is 7 billion euros on sustainable fuel for our airplanes because we can afford it and so it's the right thing that we do it. Yeah? And he actually made this outright commitment, it was actually not punished, it was actually, if anything, rewarded by capital markets. And I think that was just a bold step forward and to say, and which is market creating, yeah? because if you make such a commitment, it means markets are going to develop. So I think that is a positive example um, and, uh, and it was not that he didn't have a choice. If he wouldn't have done anything, it would still have been fine. Now actually his competitors will be forced to follow him. So uh, I believe you know, by defining something and making a step, others eventually follow. And that, that, is, that, is, that is exactly what Paul was talking about. Private companies can make a, can make a change uh, if they move bold enough. So maybe I'll just leave it with this great example. <laughs> Brilliant. And yeah. maybe coming to a, to a last question as we are running a bit out of time. Uh, question from, from Philip. We talked about senior leaders and top management's role uh, in, in the transformation. What mm -hmm. about the role of the normal employees? So every colleague on the ground, what can she or he do to drive the transformation forward? Paul. 
Well, I don't believe in that distinction that is implied in the question. I think we are all born naked and we might have a title with three letters CEO, but that doesn't mean anything. I've never felt that that gave me any more rights or bird rights. It brings perhaps a broader impact or responsibility to some extent, but everybody in a company is important and everybody has a job to do. Everybody makes decisions. Everybody has a circle of influence that can be enlarged by behavior. So we all have a role to play. And actually what you see now, I believe is that in most companies in the world that are not moving as fast as they should, and frankly, there are still many of those. I'm glad I don't have to call them out in this uh, this talk, but um, that it is actually the employees themselves in the companies that are forcing management into being more courageous. This is the first time in the history of mankind, at least I can remember, that employees walk out of companies because they're giving face recognition uh, equipment to the government or selling mattresses to the borders where children are um, separated from their parents or they are not active enough on climate change, or they're not taking fast enough actions on, um, on um, for example, um, racial uh, disparity. So the voices of employees within a company, uh, individually and collectively, are an enormous force. And if that is done constructively, around the moral values, if you want to, that we talked about, then it's very difficult for companies not to take notice. And I believe, that's actually the biggest galvanizer once more for change. I talk with a lot of fossil fuel companies and CEOs, some of them who get it and some of them who absolutely don't get it or perhaps don't care. But if your daughter or your son says to you, if this is how you behave, I have to make a choice. Either I fight for humanity or I keep you as a father. I think it gets to the heart of the matter. You don't want to have these discussions with your own children either. You have an opportunity to be on the right side of history. And if you fight as employees for these values once more, then I think your influence is infinitely higher than you probably realize yourselves. When I was the CEO of Unilever, and we were always the number one in any of the rankings from the Dow Jones to, to uh, globe scans to human rights rankings, etc., I felt actually more pressure to do more and to move these boundaries even faster from our employees, especially the millennials or the Gen Zs, than from anybody else. And, you know, so you have quite an influence, you know, and it, sometimes people think that a small thing cannot make a big difference. If you think of yourself small, I don't think so myself, but I always remind people, um, um, if you go to bed with a mosquito in a room, how a very small thing can make a big difference. I'm not advocating you're the mosquito, but you certainly can have a big influence. Thank you very much, Paul. And actually, I experienced kind of like that yesterday evening. So I'm knowing exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I like to, unfortunately, we are at the end of our session today. I'd like to thank you, a big thank you to all of you, to you, Paul, for taking the time, to you, Stefan, also for being with us, to you, Leo, here in the room. And uh, I believe if we have uh, seen one thing, if the discussion has made one thing crystal clear, then that the time for promises is over. It's time for action. I'm Reinhold Messner, and this is a sacred place. The spectacular glacier that stood here for thousands of years is nearly gone, melted in decades. The time for promises is over. It's time for action. We're engineers, startups, climbers, scientists, photographers, activists, grandmothers, kids, and Leon. We have listened and changed through thousands of renewable projects and our electricity networks. We're already saving 99 million tons of CO2 each year together. We harness space technology to power skyscrapers on hydrogen. We made our village energy independent, running on our own renewable electricity. We built one of Europe's largest networks of EV charging stations and connected 800,000 renewable power stations to our grid across Europe. And starting to set things right. Find out how we're all taking action now.